Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. The great irony when it comes to climate change is that the countries most responsible for the warming of the planet have been harmed the least, and the countries least responsible for that warming are being harmed the most. My guest calls that the gravest injustice of the 21st century. The Guilty and the Damned is the title of a recent New York Magazine cover story written by David Wallace Wells, one of the premier reporters covering our climate disaster. We'll talk to him about this appalling climate change injustice, which he explores in great detail in that article. David, welcome, thanks for joining us. My pleasure to be here, great to talk to you. Um, so your, your story in New York Magazine is uh, quite different from the reporting we usually get on climate change. Uh, for one thing, there's a greater sense of urgency and outrage about it, I thought. Um, the, uh, and as I mentioned, it has the provocative title, The Guilty and, and the Damned. So tell us about that. Who are the guilty and who are the damned? Well, the short answer is the guilty are people like you and me who live in the rich countries <laughs> of the world Great. Um, and our governments. Um, and the damned are those who we unfortunately often um, conceptualize in terms of you know lesser degrees of humanity the, the poor who live in sub-saharan africa and south asia most dramatically and you know this is not new with climate um, the rich countries in the world and the rich people of the world often look at those populations um, as you know they're certainly human but we don't respond to their suffering in the same way that we respond to suffering closer to home and climate change is putting that same narrative sort of on steroids because we are the ones, um, the fossil fuel pollution that we've produced over the last couple of centuries, and in particular over the last couple of decades, is the cause of the climate crisis that we're in today. 80% um, of fossil fuel emissions come from the G20. Um, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, which is today home to more than a billion people, is responsible for about 1% of all historical emissions. Um, and yet those are the places by accident of geography mostly, which as you mentioned in your intro, are likely to be hit hardest. There are societies that are already quite fragile and vulnerable to climate disruption and are also already seeing in, in the form of droughts and, and famines and heat waves and flooding events, um, climate impacts well beyond their capacity to respond. And because we're likely to see say twice as much warming as we've seen to this point in um, this century, even in a sort of a optimistic scenario, those countries are gonna be um, suffering much, much more even than they are today as we in, in, the, in the relatively protected parts of the world also see more intense impacts, but at a level that we are able to um, accommodate and adapt to, um, whereas much of the global South, I fear, will not. Talk a little bit about, it, it's the industrialization process that has gone on, I guess, roughly since the um, middle of the 19th century or so, um, that has led to this warming of the, of the planet. Uh, but it's also that industrialization that has uh, led as well to our higher standard of living in, in these uh, uh, northern countries. Um, so we're benef benefiting from it. So can you talk a little bit about the connection between that industrialization and, uh, and the wealth uh, that we enjoy here in America and Western Europe, for example, and other places? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a really um, central moral fact about the climate crisis, which many of us um, living prosperously are, are sort of uncomfortable to, you know, unwilling to really look clearly at. But the basic, um, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, there actually was no such thing as economic growth in the long term. Um, there were places <laughs> that were a little richer for brief periods of time, um, but over the course of a few generations, extra population growth essentially ate up that well. And so, um, humanity as a whole and societies as a whole, we're not getting notably richer, even over the course of centuries in you know, the classical period or the medieval period, 
Um, it was really only with the Industrial Revolution that that history of economic growth in which we were getting wealthier and therefore counting on getting wealthier in the future really took off. Um, there are some analysts of this history who say that really the entire history of economic growth is just about the discovery of fossil fuels, the fact that we um, came upon this free, abundant, um, or not quite free, but cheap, abundant energy source and added it to a system that was otherwise stable and made it much more dynamic. I wouldn't go quite that far, but I think the fact that we have produced so much because of um, fossil fuels over the last few centuries is a big explanation for um, a big part of the explanation for um, how much richer we've gotten, especially in the West since the middle of the 19th century. And as a result, the prosperity that you and I and everyone watching this um, is experiencing, no matter where we are on the American ladder you know, of, of wealth, by global standards, everybody in the US is quite rich, um, just about everybody. Um, everybody who's watching the show is the beneficiary of those centuries of fossil powered growth. And as a result, are the beneficiaries of economic activity that produced pollution that is today heating the planet quite disastrously and has produced what we now know to call the climate crisis. And I think there's, it's a little tricky to unpack, but while we can talk about this as a two century story, and it is that industrialization did really take off in the 19th century. Um, it's also a much more compressed narrative in which um, half of all the emissions that have ever been produced in the history of humanity have been produced in the last 25 years, which means that we have brought the planet from a relatively stable situation, scientists were worried about the long term, but not the short term, to the brink of what most scientists would call a catastrophic level of warming in the space of just 25 years, which means that most of the damage that's been done to the planet's environment has been done in my lifetime, in your lifetime, and in the lifetime of almost everyone watching this today. And I think that adds another layer of responsibility um, that many of us are, are sort of unwilling to recognize. It's not just that 18th century Americans got richer because they were burning coal. It's that today, the rich countries of the world, the G20, are the ones responsible for um, the critical catastrophic threshold that we stand upon. Um, and when we talk about climate change, we also often talk about the future. But I think my focus in this story, I think it's really important, is um, to urge readers to also think about the past and the recent past, um, because that is why we are here today. And that's because of a sort of a curious feature of carbon emissions and climate change, which is that carbon doesn't dissipate once it's up in the atmosphere. It stays there for centuries and maybe millennia, which means that any damage that's ever been done, any amount of carbon that's ever been put up there into the sky at any point in human history is still up there and it is still heating the planet. And that is why we are, we are where we are today. So. Um, you know, something, if, if we burned a, a brick of coal in 1995, that's still up there. Um, if we burned a brick of coal in 1895, that's still up there. If we burned a brick of coal in 1795, that's still up there. We're still sort of living in this um, eternal present tense climate change, living with the impacts of pollution that was produced hundreds of years ago, even, and, and most of it we know has been produced in the last 25 years, which means um, for both of those reasons, um, you know, it is, it is people like us in the countries that we live in that are responsible for, um, for the disaster that we're facing in the decades ahead. So you uh, touched on this uh, um, a little bit. You know, I think that many of us are blind, in some cases willfully blind, to the terrible damage that's being done uh, to places in the global south. But if we wanted to do the right thing, um, what is our responsibility? What's, what's the sort of thing that we should be doing and who specifically should be doing it? Well, the article uses um, a sort of a back of the envelope math equation to get to a particular dollar figure for responsibility for all of the rich nations of the world. Um, and that's not to say, I think that it's likely that the United States pays this full reparations bill, certainly in any period over the next couple of decades, I think our politics would not, you know, would not um, tolerate that. Right. But I think it sort of sets a, a useful moral standard by which we can judge what action we take, um, inevitably failing that standard, but it's useful to keep it in mind um, in, a, in a sort of baseline way as, as, a, as a map of our, um, of our guilt and responsibility. And to do that, you know, I took, we, we know how much carbon has been put into the atmosphere throughout history by each of these nations. Um, it's been tabulated in very reliable ways. Um, 
And we also using technology that's coming online now, we have technology that can actually take it out of the atmosphere. It's very expensive. It's more expensive than avoiding putting carbon up there in the first place. So it's not really useful as a way of counteracting um, what the damage we're doing today. But in terms of understanding what our true responsibility is here, it is useful in that it allows us to put a price tag on what it would take to undo all of the damage that our country and countries like ours have done. And by that math, um, the United States owes a cleanup bill of $50 trillion. Wow. It's about one fifth of the entire planet's cleanup bill. So the US is by far the world's biggest historical emitter. We have by far the most responsibility for the situation we're in. American politicians will also often talk about China. And it's true that today they're producing about double the carbon that we are. Of course, they have three to four times as many people. So even on a per capita basis today, the US is still doing worse. But no, almost no matter what happens over the next few decades, um, all of the likely decarbonization scenarios we're looking at suggest that wherever we end up, the US will still be number one. China is not going to surpass us in terms of historical emissions, which means in the final accounting, the US will always be the ultimate um, number one uh, polluter and responsible party here. And our bill is, is 50 trillion. The total bill for cleaning up all the damage for all the carbon pollution that's been put in the air since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is about $250 trillion, which is an wow. enormous in total. It's, a, it's almost total uh, global GDP. Um, and that's you know very, really quite large. The US total is about twice the US GDP. Um, but I would just say and keep two things about keeping those figures in mind. The first is um, the US has spent more than $10 trillion on pandemic relief already. Um, and that's just in over two years. So we're, we're well, some, a total like $50 trillion would have seemed comically unthinkable five years ago. Now it just seems unthinkable. <laughs> it, we, we moved it over to the window. So we're, we're spending at a level that makes these kinds of projects seem beyond the, beyond the realm of possible, but you know, we can talk about them now. And the other thing is that we wouldn't have to spend this money or do this repair work if we undertook such a project. And again, I'm not saying that's very likely, but if we did, we wouldn't have to do it over the course of five or 10 years. We could do it over the course of 50 years, or 75 years, or even 150 years. And over that course of time, spending that amount of money starts to look much more manageable. So in an ideal end game, if I were you know, put in charge of the planet's um, climate situation, we would have a very, very rapid path to decarbonization, getting to zero by 2050 or 2060. And then we would undertake collectively this project to undo every, all the damage that had been done to that point. And we could run those machines once we built them for a century or more. And in theory, at least, return the planet, not just, not just stabilize the planet's temperatures, but return the planet's climate to the situation um, that it was in before the perturbations of the Industrial Revolution. That would be a massive undertaking. Scientists often call the scale of um, work that would be necessary planetary scale. Um, but I think it is on some level the only moral response to the damage that's been engineered to this point um, by us and our forefathers. Talk a little bit about carbon removal because I think it's not uh, well understood. Um, we actually have the technology available um, to do this. We're talking about removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, removing large amounts. Uh, talk about how that works and talk about um, even if we did try how daunting a task it would be. Yeah, well, there are so basically there are big, two big categories of carbon removal. One are called nature-based solutions, which is like planting trees because trees suck carbon out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen, that's photosynthesis. Um, and then the other are technological solutions, um, the most popular of which is called direct air capture, which is basically you've got these huge fans um, sucking air uh, through big machines that separate the carbon out of the air and condense it or, or store it in some way, maybe underground in an um, old oil well, or some turn it into a carbon neutral jet fuel that you could use to fly airplanes in a, um, in a responsible way. There are a variety of things you can do with it, but basically it allows you to sort of reverse the arrow of time. Um, and if the industrial process meant like extracting coal from um, underground, burning it so it turned into smoke, this is basically, we're collecting that smoke, we're condensing it into something like coal and then burying it back underground. In theory, um, many times in the same places that we, we dug it up in the first place, since we know that that's a sort of geologically stable place for it to be. And as you say, 
these technologies are online today. Now the nature-based ones, of course we know they've been with us forever, right. but there are real limitations in the sense that to meaningfully um, address even the sort of hardest to decarbonize sectors, um, you know, jet fuel heavy industry would require planting new forest land that would take up something like a third or maybe even half of all the world's arable land, which we need to grow food. Um, so they're, they're not, it's great to plant trees, but there are natural limits to how much we can do with that. Um, on the technological side, um, these machines are, have been built. They do work. They do store this carbon. They're pretty expensive to run. Um, there's one large scale plant in operation today in Iceland, and they charge um, for carbon removal about $500 or $600 a ton today, um, which is you know, quite a lot. It's much bigger than any carbon tax that's been proposed. Um, and you know, if you put a carbon tax of $600 a ton on carbon, our carbon emissions would go pretty down pretty quickly. So this is not exactly an economical way of handling the climate crisis. On the other hand, most analysts suggest that um, even with some minimal support from public um, forces from public investment, um, the price of that removal is gonna to fall to something close to $100 a ton pretty quickly. And even then, it'll still be more expensive than avoiding putting carbon in the atmosphere in the first place, but it may help us deal with some of these sectors that we wouldn't be able to decarbonize otherwise. So we have the tech, it's not quite economical yet, but we think within a few decades, it probably will be to some degree. Um, the problem is the engineering problem, which is to say, this is an enormous amount of carbon that's up there. Um, right. It's 2,500 gigatons, which means it's 2,500 billion tons of carbon. And it's hard to believe because carbon dioxide is a gas. <laughs> it's hard to believe that it actually weighs, any amount of it weighs 2,500 billion tons. But in fact, that is the scale of damage that we're talking about and the scale of the damage that we need to undo. And to give you a sense of just how dramatic a scale up we would need, you know, the IPCC, the UN's climate change body, draws all these scenarios um, for how we could get to relatively comfortable climate outcomes. And their most optimistic um, decarbonization path, the one that they say would probably allow us or would give us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees of warming, which is a little bit above where we are today. Um, that would require this unbelievably rapid transition. You've probably heard, you know, cut at carbon emissions by about 50% by 2030 and get to zero by 2050. That's the path that I'm talking about. That's the, what, you know, they also right. say in addition to decarbonizing that fast, so this would be this, this Herculean decarbonization project requiring the, the IPCC says a World War II scale global mobilization starting in 2019. So we obviously haven't, we're not on track for it yet, but it would require an absolutely dizzyingly fast path of decarbonization. And on top of that, they would require so much of this um, negative emissions carbon removal technology that we would need to be opening one of these plants every single day between now and 2050. And wow. today there is, there is one of them <laughs> operational right. anywhere in the world. So, and that's just on top of the unbelievably rapid decarbonization that we need to do. So if we're trying to do even more of it to um, not just get us to net zero, but past net zero and actually take carbon out of the atmosphere, it's gonna take an even bigger industrial effort, a global industrial effort. Um, and we haven't even really begun to think about or plan for that. And my point in this article is not to focus on that as a solution, although personally, I. I think in the long term it will be helpful, is just to use that technology to showcase just how big the damage that we've done really is, just how expensive it would be to truly undo it, and just what it means um, that such a catastrophic burden has been placed particularly on the global south by the nations of the global north. We can calculate that value, that cost, and it is unbelievably large, and that fact should orient all of our thinking in the global north when we talk about what we're capable of, what, what seems politically feasible in addressing climate change. We should be, I think, shamed by just how big our guilt on this issue really is into doing much, much, much more than we are today. Even if we don't meet the standards set by that guilt, it should pull us in the direction of more and faster action um, if we allow ourselves to really see it clearly. Right. You mentioned the burden on the global south. There are people in the global south who are fighting back, who are uh, committed to uh, battling this problem. And you write about a number of them in your article. And one of the, uh, one of the ones who stood out uh, was a woman named uh, Vanessa, and I think you pronounce it Nakate, from uh, Uganda. Can you talk a little bit about her and what she's doing? <laughs> 
Yeah, she's an incredible um, youth climate activist. She sort of amazingly first came to global prominence because she was she was cropped out of, I think it was an Associated Press photo um, in which they had taken a photo of five of the world's leading youth climate activists, four of whom were white, and they cropped her out of the photo. And that's a, a pretty useful um, little case study in how the world has regarded the climate activists of the global south, which is to say, we've given a fair amount of airtime to people like Greta Thunberg. Um, we've done a lot less to those people in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia who are um, in many cases fighting a, a much harder fight because they're um, advocating for change in, you know, um, uh, in the face of governments who are much more hostile to their advocacy, much less open to radical climate action. Um, and Vanessa is, I think, you know, her, she just has an incredibly um, vivid, um, compelling, gripping, and moral perspective on the damage that's been done to her country and countries like hers. Um, she gave an incredibly memorable speech in Milan a few weeks before the Glasgow conference this past fall, where she was basically, you know, saying, you know, you guys talk about adaptation, you cannot adapt to extinction. Um, and, wow. and, you know, Greta is, I think, an, also an incredibly inspiring, powerful and important moral voice on this issue, but she's really speaking to her own people, her own country and countries like hers, you know, Sweden, where she was, she was saying basically like, look at your hypocrisy. You say you care about the climate and yet you're doing so little. There's this huge gap between your stated rhetoric and your policies. How can you live with yourself? That's her, her basic message. And Vanessa's message is much more um, from those who are suffering towards those inflicting the suffering. And her message is really, look what you're doing to us. You are killing us. You are killing our agriculture. You're killing our societies. And you know, to some degree, um, on some level, you're literally killing us Africans and people who are living like us in, in South Asia. Um, and that is a, it's a much harsher message. I think it is animated by, um, by I mean, that's, it's the true story. Um, it's, she's not misleading right. about it, but it, it's, it's, it's meant that her advocacy has had a, um, it's had a harder time reaching Western audiences who are, who are much, um, even though Greta may seem like a, um, an alarmist and, and an extremist, um, compared to Vanessa's perspective, she seems she's a much more um, digestible, um, easy to easy to take um, voice. And so, one of the things I was trying to do in this article was to elevate um, Vanessa and not just her, a few other activists um, who've distinguished themselves over the last couple of years um, in really focusing or trying to focus global attention on this. I think um, urgent, you know, moral failing, which is that um, the countries of the global north are starting to respond to the climate crisis. They're making some worst case scenarios less likely, but almost certainly they've waited too long to really spare the people of the global South um, who don't have the capacity to adapt and respond. And as I said earlier, are not in any way meaningfully responsible for the situation that they or their children and grandchildren will find themselves in. I think it's difficult for people who are not paying particularly close attention to climate change uh, to sort through the ins and outs of this difficult issue. Uh, from your perspective, um, what are the potential solutions um, that, that you feel hold genuine promise as opposed to those that are either uh, very difficult or too costly or politically not feasible or however one wants to characterize it? What, what, what are you hopeful about? Well, in general, I think we're in an all hands on deck kitchen sink kind of a moment in which we, we can't afford to pick and choose between the solutions. We sort of need everything. But where I start from is the fact that um, according to Carbon Tracker, which is a, a quite um, esteemed um, industry study group in England, 90% um, of the world's population now lives in places where renewable energy is cheaper than dirty energy. Which means that for all we heard for a generation about how expensive and burdensome a transition to a green economy would be, 90% of the world now lives in places where anytime you're building new energy capacity, you should be new building renewable energy capacity. Many parts of the world, it's now cheaper to build new renewables than it is to continue running old, dirty capacity. And in parts of the world like the US, um, you know, you can make the case just on, on the basis of electricity bills that we'll be better off if we decarbonize quite rapidly, that by 2050, right. we'll be in a better spot than we would be if we stayed on, on dirty energy. Even beyond that, the entire energy transition in the US could be paid for um, by the 
public health benefits of cleaner air. So um, the entire cost of the green energy transition would be entirely um, paid for by how much longer we'd be living and healthier we'd be living and how much less burden we'd be putting on our healthcare system. So even if you, if you look at it either in a dollars and cents way or in a public health way, in, on either metric, it more than pays for itself, which means that the argument for a fast transition is really, really clear in the US and it's really, really clear in the developing world where new energy really should be renewable. And that is a total game changer. It is very different from where it was, where we were 10 years ago, where anybody trying to undertake a transition was worrying about the additional cost. Even Bill Gates in his recent climate book talks about this green premium, the extra cost we'll have to shoulder to move into this new sustainable future. But that is not the economics of decarbonization. Now. The economics of decarbonization are screaming at us that we'll be more prosperous and more healthy no matter where we are in the world um, if we move faster. Well, we're gonna to have to stop there. We've been talking with David Wallace Wells. Uh, his article in New York Magazine is called The Guilty and the Dam. David, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.